morning and open them to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Notice I didn't say if you have your Bibles (laughs) because I'm assuming that all of us have our Bibles. We're going to look at hearing but not doing this morning. And I think that the passage that we're going to look at is talking about the people's reactions to Ezekiel and the prophecy that he has brought. But I think it's also a very clear picture of the church today, the church in general. Because as we look at it and we see what they're saying, the things that they're doing, the things that are going on here, then we can understand and see that a lot of it applies to today. When we hear, but we don't do. I was thinking of another thing too, and it's thinking about a gradually declining church. Churches start to decline, they plateau, then they start to decline gradually and then it picks up. And I thought about Charles Spurgeon and the downgrade controversy that started with a publication that Spurgeon put out. He didn't write the article, but he let it go about pastors that were not believing in the deity of Jesus or the atoning death of Jesus, and how that started a slippery slope, a downgrade uh, that people were going through. And I think that as we look at the Bible today, and we see what is said here, that we could kind of get the same idea from this. Because once we start doing what the people of Judah we're doing with Ezekiel in captivity, then the same process starts here. God has really blessed Brown Road Baptist Church, and I had not even thought about this being the first anniversary while I was doing it. I knew it because I asked Linda to get these figures for me and Carolyn to get the ones that she had. So I knew it, but I just wasn't thinking about this being the first anniversary. But as I think about it, this fits in very well because God has really blessed the year that we have been here. We want God to continue to bless Brown Road Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see it happen even more so. But the only way for that to happen is for us to remain obedient to Him, give Him the glory for everything that takes place, and then to even become more committed than what we already are to Him and the work that He's got for us to do as a church. So stand with me. As I read, and you can follow along in your Bibles or on the screen, Ezekiel chapter 33, beginning in verse 30. Now, pay really close attention here to what is being said, and see if you don't see the church today. As for you, son of man, The children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, Please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song, as one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. 
For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Father, as we come to you again today, it is to rejoice. Praise you for the salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins, of being set free from the bondage to sin. A home with you in heaven for all eternity. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. The baptism and filling of the Holy Spirit, the power that comes with Him, the teaching, the sealing, the direction, everything that you do for us. I pray, Father, that we will not be a church that hears your words, but doesn't do them. But that we will serve you, be obedient to you, and do everything that you would have us to do to grow your kingdom. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Let's think about this for a little bit this morning as we think about what God is doing and how we react to what God is doing. See, it's not only Ezekiel that talked about it. James uh, brings it out as well in the book of James. He says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is or was. So we're to not only hear the word, but we're to do the word. Now, as we look at this passage, there are some things I want to bring out in this passage that is applicable to us and to the church in general but to us because we're here. And we need to be, you know, we say we Baptists are people of the book. We've got to be people of the book. And that means we get into the book and we read it, we pray about it, we understand it, and then we're obedient to it. Not our customs, not our traditions. Traditions can be well good, and we appreciate that. But traditions are not the Word of God. They are what we do. We've got a young lady here that's in the Navy and out on leave and came uh, today, and I don't know if the Navy still teaches this, but Tom was in the Navy and some of the rest of you. When I was in boot camp, they teach you everything to do their way. One of the things they taught me is your shoes will be laced right over left. If you look at any pairs of shoes today that I've got that's got laces in them, they will be laced right over left. If I buy them left over right, they made a terrible mistake. That needs to be corrected. That's a tradition. Traditions are okay. But when traditions come up against the Word of God and they aren't backed by the Word of God, then they're not okay. Uh, So... When we look at this, I want you to see how this really applies to the church today. First thing we see here is the people. Now, remember, 
The siege was already going on at Judah. A lot of them had already been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Ezekiel, Daniel uh, were two that had already been taken. Nehemiah already taken into captivity. Ezra already taken into captivity. And the city of Jerusalem was getting ready to fall and everyone that was there would either be killed or taken into captivity as well. Now these are the people that are being talked about here, that God is bringing up here. People that are defeated, people that are in captivity. People that are seeing God at work in their lives and bringing His chastisement upon them because they've been told over and over and over that it was for their disobedience to God that these things were happening. Now, as we look at it, and we see, first of all, the people really liked the preacher. They loved listening to the preacher. Now, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, well... The Bible tells us that at the end times people will want their ears tickled and they don't want to hear the Word of God. They just want to hear something that makes them feel good about themselves. But then I thought, well, that's not the message Ezekiel was preaching. Ezekiel wasn't a health and wealth preacher. Ezekiel was preaching doom and gloom. He was preaching and telling them, yeah, there will, be a come, will come a time that God is going to restore you, but that's going to be a long time from now. And God's judgment is going to be upon you until then. Ezekiel wasn't preaching a pretty message. He was telling them exactly what God wanted them to know But you know, a lot of people are like that today too. A preacher can preach about heaven, about hell, about sin, and it kind of just goes over their head. Maybe he's got a good personality, maybe he's got a good voice, maybe a lot of other things about him, and people really like him. Now, look at what they were saying here. Look at what God said in verse 30. As for you, son of man, The children of your people are talking about you. Beside the walls and in the doors of your houses, the people are talking about you everywhere they're at. People are talking about you. Now what they were saying about Ezekiel was good. A lot of people leave church and have roast preacher for lunch. I hope you're not one of them. (laughs) Or it gives you a sour stomach if you do. (laughs) But he said, Ezekiel, listen. All the people are talking about you everywhere they're at. The walls, the doors, they're all talking about you. And speak to one another. Everyone saying to his brother, Hey, you need to come listen to this preacher. Man, this one's on fire. This one's got what it takes. Everybody needs to come and listen to this preacher. But the preacher was preaching judgment. He wasn't preaching peace and happiness. He wasn't preaching, give me some money and God will really bless you. He was telling them like it was. Now, doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? You got a preacher, a prophet, in Ezekiel's case, that's really preaching, bringing the message, repent. You're under judgment from God. You've got to repent. God will restore us eventually, but it's going to be a very long time before we're ever restored.
Well, the people wanted to hear it. And they wanted to invite other people to come. Why wasn't there a change in the people? If they liked the message so much, why didn't they change? Why didn't they repent? Instead of just saying, boy, we, we got the best preacher around. Everybody ought to leave wherever they're going and come and hear this preacher. He preached, but it made no difference to the people. They were stuck where they were at. They wanted to hear it, and they didn't mind hearing it, but it didn't make any difference to them. And it never had an effect on them. How many people today will go out of churches all across this country and around the world and pat the preacher on the back and say, boy, you, you really did it today. You really let us have it today. You stepped on my toes and you stepped on you probably stepped on the toes of most other people. Now, think how impossible a statement that is. Tom and Kathy are with us today. Now, suppose Tom comes up to me after church and says, Boy, you really stepped on my toes today. But yet, I've ne I don't leave this platform. How could I do that? And we all know it's the Holy Spirit's conviction, it's not me. But they would listen to Ezekiel and they would, boy, what a, you're the best. You really lay it on the line, Ezekiel. You let us have it, Ezekiel. But it doesn't make any difference in the person's life. You know, I want Brown Road to grow. But when I pray, I don't pray, Lord, send us greater numbers. I pray, Lord, help us grow spiritually. When we grow spiritually, the numbers happen. We don't have to pray for greater numbers. We just need to grow and become more like Jesus. And the more like Jesus we become, the more the numbers will increase in the church. It's just natural. It's the way it is. The way God works. Now, not only did they look at Ezekiel and really like the preacher, they understood that the message was from God. And look again at verse 30, the last phrase of verse 30. Please come and hear what the Lord is, what the word is that comes from the Lord. They not only liked Ezekiel's preaching, they understood that the message that he had came from God. It wasn't Ezekiel's message. It wasn't something that Ezekiel sat down and thought, well, I need to pick out a topic that I can preach about next Sunday or Saturday for him. I need to pick out a topic that everyone will like or I need to pick out a topic that's going to be a real hard hitter or something like that. No, Ezekiel's message came from the Lord. I faced a dilemma at one time because I had books that had sermon outlines in them. One of them that was probably 20 some volumes, the illustrated sermon outline thing or something like that. I mean, man, it, you could go to any verse, any passage in the Bible and There'd be 10, 15 sermon outlines and illustrations to go along with it. So when you're sitting there and you're thinking about a sermon for Sunday and nothing's coming to you, right there's 20-some volumes 
up there. Now, I'm not saying that's bad because a lot of preachers have them. But I sold mine simply because when I preach, it needs to come from the Lord. It doesn't need to come from someone else's. And I, and I know all the arguments will... God inspired it once, it's still inspired forever. God inspired it for that person, not me. And listen to what the people were saying. They were saying, we've got the best preacher around. Everyone needs to come and hear our preacher. And you know, the word that our preacher is preaching isn't something that he's making up. It comes from the Lord. Now, if I were sitting there in that congregation and I were, was one of those people and I was thinking about this and thinking about this preacher's really pouring his heart into it and I believe that this is the word that God wants us to hear, then maybe I might ought to do something about it. But God says, they're listening, but they're not doing. They hear it. I bet you, if I were a betting person, which I'm not, uh, there's got to be a better phrase than that. But it's not coming to me. I believe that you could probably have asked any one of those people that was listening to Ezekiel prophesy or preach and they could tell you exactly what he's seen, what he had been preaching about. And remember too, secondly, that they're saying this message is from God. This message is coming from God. So I would think that there should be some action if I really believe that what that preacher is saying is coming from God, then I might ought to start changing the way I act, and maybe the way I believe so that I can be pleasing to God and not displeasing to God. And then we have just total disobedience to God. I hear it. I believe it's from God, but it doesn't make any difference. I know everything that there is to know about it, but I'm not changing. I am the way I am. This is the way we believe. Boy, the Pharisees had a big problem with that, didn't they? The Jews had a big problem with that. The early Christians that were saved, that were Jewish, had a big problem with that. Because they had to change a lot of things that they believed and that they had been taught ever since they were babies. Man, you take a good Baptist that has been brought up in the Baptist church and their grandparents went to that church, their parents went to that church, and they're still in that church. You can never get them to change some of the things that they do. Even when you show that it might even be unbiblical. And then we read the Bible and we look at the Jews and say, boy, they were hard-headed. It's a good thing they were Jews and not Baptists when the church started. There are three things here. 
I'll cover them kind of quickly. Three things here about disobeying the Word of God or not obeying the Word of God. They didn't exactly disobey, they just didn't obey the Word of God. So it's not something that they overtly did, it's something that they overtly failed to do in serving God. It denies the authority of God. If I look at the Bible, I read the Bible, or I hear some preacher or teacher teaching, and I know that it is coming from the Word of God, and that God is using that, God is speaking through that, and I fail to do what is being said that I should do, then I am denying the authority of God. If I fail to witness when the Bible says that we're to be witnesses, I am denying the authority of God. I'm saying God doesn't have the authority to tell me to do that. If I don't tithe, if I don't give 10% of my income to God through the storehouse, which is the church, I'm denying the authority of God. I'm saying God has no right to tell me that I need to tithe. And you see, I can be a tither and give 10%, but I can never say I've given God anything because that 10% already belonged to God. I just didn't steal what belonged to God. I don't give God anything until I go beyond the 10% tithe. Then I'm giving an offering to God. But if I'm not a tither, then I'm denying the authority of God. I pray if I don't pray without ceasing. If I don't praise and rejoice, then I am denying the authority of God. I'm saying God doesn't have the right to tell me to do that. God doesn't have the right to tell me to pray. God doesn't have the right to tell me to speak to one another in songs and spiritual songs and be joyful with each other. God doesn't have that authority to do that. I'm denying the authority of God. Secondly, I'm denying the power of God. When I say... I don't have to do what God wants me to do, or, yeah, God wants me to tithe, or God wants me to witness, God wants me to do this. I know all that, but I can't be a witness. I can't do any of these things because I'm too shy. I'm too much of an introvert. I've told you all this before. Those of you who have been around a while, you know how much of an introvert I am? I'm kind of coming out of it just a wee little bit. I am such an introvert that whenever I got up enough courage to ask a girl out on a date in high school, I'd go to her house, knock on her door. She'd open up the door. I'd say, hello, we'd go out. We'd go back to her house. I'd say goodbye, and those were the only words she heard (laughs) all night long because I couldn't talk. To a girl. That's how much of an introvert I was. But yet God called me to be a pastor. So you see, it's not up to you, it's up to God. If God wants you to do something, God will give you the power to be able to do it. And God has said that you are to be a witness. So don't say, I can't witness because I'm too shy or I don't know what to say. You're denying the power of God. Whatever God has called you to do, whatever mission that God has given you to do, God is going to give you the power to do it. And the third thing is we're denying the consequences that come with denying the authority and the power of God. The consequences were, they were under the chastisement of God Almighty. 
They were under the chastisement of God because of their disobedience to God. Now look at how God ends this passage. Because this is God speaking to Ezekiel here. In verse 33, And when this comes to pass, surely it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. They're going to see that I'm not kidding. They're going to see I'm not playing games. They're going to see that everything that I have said that's going to happen is going to happen. And they're going to remember what you have been warning them about all this time. They will know that a prophet has been among them. I don't want Brown Road Baptist Church ever to get into the position that we come under the chastisement of God because of disobedience to Him. I don't want us to get into the position to where we talk about how good the sermons are or how good God's Word is, but ignore the things that He tells us to do in His Word. That's what the people of Judah were doing. That's what the people of Israel had done before. And God's chastisement had fallen upon them. Folks, we can look at things and we can say whatever we want to. But unless we are being obedient to the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, obedient to the Word, then we're subject to coming under the chastisement of God. It's got to be the Word. That's why we teach the Word here. I preach the Word. I don't hop, skip, and around and pick a topic that I like or that I think you might like. We go through books of the Bible and we go through the verses of them. The Word here at Brown Road. But if I ignore doing what it's telling me to do, then what good is it? What good is it? Some of you know that there's eternal life through Jesus Christ. But if you have never truly repented of your sins and invited Him to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, you'll never have that eternal life, that forgiveness of sins. It will never apply to you until you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know it. You have heard it. You probably even believe it. But until you act upon it, it doesn't matter. You need to come and invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. There are Christians here that believe that when we are obedient to God, that God will bless us. We even believe that God will enable us to do anything that He wants us to do. The problem is we just don't want to do. Or we want it our way. It's got to be my way. But yet in the Word of God it's very clear who we are and what we do and how we do it. Maybe you need to rededicate your life today. Maybe you just need to pray and say, Lord God, I don't want to just be a hearer of your word. I want to be a doer of your word. Are you here and you not, you're not a member of Brown Road, but you know that this is where God wants you to be. And if it's where God wants you to be, then it's where you need to be. Then you need to come and join this morning. Father, 
As we come to you now, we do thank you and praise you for all that you've done. And I pray that as the Holy Spirit convicts and draws people to you this morning, that many will come for salvation, for rededication, for church membership, whatever it may be. That they'll come and not just be hearers of the word, but doers of it as well. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we stand and sing, only trust him, you come.